Ross's career spans more than four decades. He's traveled all around the world embedding with and photographing hate groups, gangs, and armies. These stories are part of his memoir, Angle, Fighting Censorship, Death Threats, Ethical Traps in a Landmine, while winning a Pulitzer along the way. In 1977, the Associated Press sent then 23-year-old Ross to cover the guerrilla war in Rhodesia, now modern-day Zimbabwe. His photos revealed the brutal treatment of residents under the rule of the minority white Rhodesian government. Let's talk about your Pulitzer Prize. It came at such a young age. One of the things I saw in one interview was that you even, if I, if I have this right, uh, you even offered to pay for your plane ticket uh, to go cover this, this story. And talk to us about that story and, and some of the controversy that came out as a result of it as well. I uh, introduced myself to the Associated Press because I had uh, done a couple of stories that uh, gained a wider attention. They said, oh yes, we, uh, we appreciated you forwarding those to us and we really liked them. Um, why don't you become a stringer for us in London for a while? And uh, my mentor there was Horst Foss, uh, who was the Associated Press photographer in Vietnam, uh, famous not only for all of the pictures that he um, uh, encouraged and fostered there as the photo editor, but he himself being a working photojournalist and winning a couple of Pulitzer Prizes himself. So he took me under his wing and said, um, there's a weak spot, a blind spot in AP's worldwide coverage. We want you to go to Africa because right now all we get are government handout photos and they're pretty much worthless. But I have some old friends uh, in Rhodesia right now, who are uh, friends of mine in Vietnam. This is Horst Foss telling me this. And he says, I'll give you their contacts. You get in touch with them and they may, able, may be able to get you behind the scenes. And sure enough, when I arrived, I found Vietnam veterans enraged by their defeat uh, after that long war and determined to continue fighting communists wherever they could find them. And the thought of being able to hunt with machine guns for uh, communists in the bush country of Rhodesia was heaven for them. And so I was finding dozens of Americans who signed up to become uh, Rhodesian soldiers. And lo and behold, they held a barbecue every Saturday afternoon. And I wangled an invitation to meet them. And when I met the senior most American, he was a major, um, and uh, introduced myself, said, I'm working for the Associated Press. Why don't you let me come along with you? He said, well, we're not going to babysit you. And we never take other journalists. And in fact, uh, every other journalist was stuck in the capital city just waiting for handout photos. And I said, no, no, I, I only want to see the real thing but you've got to take me along. And he said, well, we're not going to babysit you. You're going to have to be in uniform. You're going to have to ride a horse just like we do. And if you can't handle that, then, you know, you're not invited. But I, through a, a lot of bluster and bluff, I just said, you know, take me along. And I was suddenly in the middle of a search and destroy mission to hunt out a civilian collaborators of the guerrilla movement, brutally torture them. Uh, I watched one local black politician tortured to death over three days, and I was able to take pictures. Um, that also became very edgy, whether they were going to allow me to stay, and eventually I had to smuggle my rolls of film out uh, to our bureau in Johannesburg, South Africa. To get access to his subjects, Ross has had to feign sympathies towards certain groups, even dressing like them to blend in. Oftentimes I'm trying to blend in with my subjects so thoroughly. In the case of Rhodesia, they demanded that I wear a uniform. I mean, I probably could have worn some other kind of subdued khaki clothing and felt comfortable. I would have stood out a little bit differently. But then in later stories, I purposely said, hey, I'm, you know, traveling with you guys. 
you know, if we, if we wanted to think of a kind of a headline for my career, it would be fellow traveler, because I travel with the group, whatever it is. And I started preaching this philosophy and said, no, we're not there as members of the press wearing, you know, white jumpsuits with, you know, angels' wings that we can fly off if things get tricky. Uh, instead, I want to be embedded. And sure enough, after I made that argument for the umpteenth time uh, to the Defense Information Agency and to the Pentagon, uh, then I think that's what helped to change their minds, uh, the difference between the antagonism they felt towards the press when I was in Grenada and we were banned. And then eventually during Desert Storm, when they finally said, no, come along uh, and you'll be just like a member of the unit. There's advantages and disadvantages to that. And, uh, you know, that's what uh, my expertise in ethics uh, invites because, you know, we need to think that through as well. But I would much rather be on the scene rather than uh, blocked and kept back, pinned up a mile away. Expertise in ethics. Uh, that's a nice segue into some of the ethical dilemmas or, or question marks about what you've done. And I mean, this is all territory you've covered many times, but I just want to kind of go there, allow you to kind of talk about it, and then we can move on to some other subjects. But but you mentioned uh, someone being tortured right there before your very eyes and people saying, wait, why didn't you intervene? Why didn't you try and stop it? That's one ethical dilemma that you've talked about. The other, of course, being, you know, you, you dress up as a gang member, you dress up as a you know, somebody in uniform, you, you take on kind of their persona. People really have questions about that. And yet, I think you would agree, um, I've been in this business a long time. Cameras appear and people kind of put on a performance or they change. And when you are kind of embedded, you can strip away that veneer. There's, there's an advantage to what you're talking about. One thing I can uh, attest to and absolutely guarantee you is that my method of disappearing within the story has given me genuinely candid moments where my subjects forget that I'm a journalist at all. Part of that is my manner, my posture, my style, my friendliness, and I would say even more importantly, my uh, innate uh, empathy. When you agree to become the um, conveyor of someone's story, they may not understand all of the uh, concerns that you have as a photojournalist about lighting, about angle, about uh, um, you know, time of day. Um, and your deadline. But uh, if you can collaborate to that degree, uh, they will, you'll ask them questions like, oh, uh, you know, how often do children get locked up in cages, border guardsmen? And he said, oh, well, every Friday, it's Fridays when we tend to get in a whole busload and we put them all in cages and we leave them for the weekend. You know, we give them enough water to survive and a little bit of food. And, of course, all the kids with diapers are in a horrible condition by Monday. And I say, oh, well, then actually that's when I need to be there. And they'll say, are you kidding? You, you, I mean, you want to show us at our worst? And I say, well, yes, I need to show you at your best and I need to show you at your worst. But it's when the issues that everybody's talking about are coming to a boil. And that's when I need to see it. I need to be a witness for that. You've covered uh, through your career, not just the Nazis here in the United States, but Klansmen, uh, KKK, uh, white supremacists, uh, and, and we see them flourishing again right now. So uh, is it just a case that they've always been there in plain sight? We just have, have stopped noticing. Talk to us about what, you know, from your experience, how do you see this? Well, um, it's interesting that um, Americans who fought during World War II came home and were um, pulled into this notion of a disciplined country, um, a far-right conservative country. Uh, we know that even leading up to World War II, that people like Charles Lindbergh and Henry Ford were um, very friendly towards the Nazis, didn't think that America should get involved, uh, pretended as though the Atlantic Ocean was going to be our natural defense. And as much as George Washington had warned us, don't become entangled in foreign alliances. 
uh, that was one of the same arguments that the Nazis I met in Chicago used to try and uh, recruit and justify their meetings. But in my own life, and this is a little personal, a little frightening, my father was in World War II uh, in Guam. And his immediate uh, mentors and superior officers were Robert McNamara, who later became Secretary of Defense and an architect of the Vietnam War, and General Curtis LeMay, who was deeply involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis and uh, was goading JFK to go to war with Russia. So these are the two key figures in my father's life. And when my father came back to America, he wanted to continue and foster this sense of American discipline and authority. Now, unless you think I'm exaggerating, he would reward my brother and I at the age of nine years old for me, for getting good grades by giving us Nazi memorabilia, a helmet, a dagger, a Hitler youth knife, eventually pistols. And he had absolutely no qualms at all about treating these as honored uh, objects in our home. But I realized as I grew older and felt myself opposed to the war in Vietnam, and to see his strong anti-communist fervor, that we became um, alienated uh, for most of our lives, simply because the politics clashed so much. Uh, I became this crusader against fascism and authoritarianism, and in fact, it epitomized my father. Only in the very last few years of his life, I moved down to Florida and we reconciled. So at the age of, you know, 85, uh, he, he had finally relaxed a little bit. Ross's assignments have taken him to the heart of some of the bloodiest conflicts in the world, including the Salvadoran Civil War from 1980 to 1982, which claimed 75,000 lives. Let's talk about your time in Zimbabwe, Rhodesia at the time, uh, your time with the Palestinians. These are going off into war zones, difficult, I mean, dangerous uh, circumstances. Take us to El Salvador because that became extraordinarily dangerous for you. There was a volcano where the guerrillas had formed at the top. I found myself behind a cordon. Uh, the, the government soldiers were blocking the road and we couldn't even get to the volcano, even though I knew every inch of it intimately and knew exactly where the gorillas would be hiding. Uh, and so I decided to come back around the long way, which would have required several more hours of circuitous, dangerous driving. And I had with me two other, um, actually three other correspondents. One was going to be the guy who who uh, subbed for me because this was my last mission for uh, several weeks that I would have off, much needed, along with the uh, reporter and then another fellow. We were all from Newsweek. And uh, I decided that we would um, play it fast and loose and dangerous to use a back road to get to the volcano. All of the villagers that saw us go by said, no, 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 don't go that way. It's, it's uh, it's mined, you know, you'll have terrible luck, you'll get hurt or killed. And I just decided that I was going to uh, make my way along this trail with a stick out in front of me, waving it back and forth like a blind man. And I thought if I whistled nice and loud, that oftentimes in conjunction with a minefield, there are um, spotters that are looking to see who's coming. Uh, that if they were fellow guerrillas, they could warn them off. Um, but as a journalist, I didn't know whether I was going to be lucky enough to meet one of these lookouts, or if I was just going to blunder into terrible trouble or miss the minefield. So I was feeling ridiculously, uh, you know, risky. And I was uh, uh, whistling along, and suddenly there was a rustling in the grass next to me. Uh, I thought it was like a small animal or something that I had stumbled upon. 
but instead it was a bouncing Betty landmine. It's about the size of a soup can. It jumps up out of the ground and explodes at waist height, trying to kill more people. And in my case, it didn't work. It malfunctioned because when it exploded, it sent the entire charge into my left leg, into my knee, lifted me off the ground, threw me off over to the side, wounded my replacement, even though he was far in the back, superficially. He just got wounded on his knees, on his, on his thighs. But when I uh, came to clear thinking after a moment, I was foolish enough to think that I'm going to try and walk out of here. And as I stood up and put all my weight on that left leg, it accordion down and you know, the shock just sent me reeling. And uh, the other Newsweek people had to carry me out fireman style, and then they even sent a helicopter from the Capitol to pick us up. Uh, and that's when I realized I didn't have many more of my nine lives to, to spend. In addition to covering conflict zones, Ross has captured societal changes in different parts of the world, including China. Let's talk about uh, your time in China after the opening up. Uh, what was that experience like? What are some of your memories? Well, um, again, Life Magazine wanted me to photograph the first rock and roll concert in China. And this was in 1984. So it was at a time when there was still um, uh, a, a great deal of um, control and uniformity and uh, uh, anxiety in the general public, particularly among the People's Liberation Army, uh, when they were deciding what was safe to do and what was beyond the pale. I found out about the children of American embassy employees. And they said, yeah, we have a, a garage band. And on you know, weekends, we all get together and play just for fun for ourselves. But then they decided, like uh, guerrilla theater, to go walking out in the middle of Tiananmen Square and start playing rock and roll, you know, impromptu until the crowd starts gathering around. And then suddenly a political officer shows up and they better get moving. And then they go out in front of a department store. Uh, they hold a, a rock concert. And the first Chinese that came to learn how to uh, dance it was just the most exuberant, amazing, childlike demonstration you'd ever want to see. Uh, at the same time, I found out uh, also for a sister publication of Life magazine, it was actually in the trial stages. It's called Picture Week. And they wanted to do a story on the largest cosmetic surgery hospital in the world, which the Chinese had uh, developed in Beijing in part a result of their war in Korea when they had so many troops coming home disfigured from combat. And so they became very expert at mass scale, quick, low technology cosmetic surgery. Now, just as the dawn of rock and roll had reached China, there were many women who wanted to have their eyes changed and their noses enlarged so that they would look more like the strong Caucasian Western Hollywood version of beauty. They thought, my eyes, they're too narrow. I want my eyes widened. And they would literally have the, their eyelids tucked back with surgery. And so I photographed that and found it to be as much pain in the name of beauty, as I ever saw on the battlefield. From your book, there's this column by your old boss, and he talks about uh, getting to the paper early in the mornings around 6 a.m., <laughs> and he'd see Ross wiping his eyes uh, coming out of the dark room. Right. And he'd spent all night there, sleeping at the, at the newspaper place, uh, if you will. <laughs> um, I think that says a lot about your dedication. So, like, looking back on your long career, uh, if people were to sum you up, how would you like them to look back on, on what you've done, your contributions? Well, uh, the energy and commitment you described we'd put under the heading of just Ross is driven. But um, 
I think more important than that is before you rush out the door, thinking that it's time to go cover the Capitol riot, it might be more important for you to stop and say, no, 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 I'm, I'm too late for that. Because I really needed to see all of these people as they were plotting and planning, which is really, I mean, it's not just a Capitol riot. It was a conspiracy to commit a riot. And I find that to be a much more compelling part of the story. So um, if someone's going to sum up my entire career, I hope that they say the strategy and analysis and insight and the point of insertion is probably the most important key of all. And we'll leave it there. Ross, thanks so much. Okay.